We're going to read in James chapter 1 and verse 18. And this, this, uh, then we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. But James chapter 1 verse 18, Of his own will beget us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Now I want you to hold on to that, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 20, verse 20, the apostle says, But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. Christ, the first one out of that grave, telling us that other people are going to come. He was the first fruits of that resurrection. Then chapter 1 and verse 18 of 1 Corinthians. Chapter 1, verse 18. That you get there. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. But under us, which are saved, it is the power of God. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself, I say, whether there be things in earth or things in heaven. Then in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24, you could quote this, and, but you hold there in the book of Matthew because we'll come back there a little later. But in Matthew 16, verse 24, then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now in this verse of Scripture we read, and what we've read here, God has invited us in this, in this convention tonight to be a part of that first fruit. I, I believe that God spoke this to me in Israel. This is a part of the school of Christ. You that heard it know. I may not go all the direction that it goes there. But God had led me in the night. I'd prayed much on dealing with those. You could see it beginning to break, to crack. And God dealt with me to go to this lesson. And there in that lesson that morning, I, I saw the thing begin to break. Man, that brother uh, McGee there, God had pulled his heart. He always, when he goes, somebody's going to give an offering. He just feels. But God knew him. His name was Mamar. A, a wonderful man. He'd been there watching, listening. But that morning, just unashamedly, God began to break him. And for the rest of that lesson, it was a tremendous moving of God. Nobody run around the building, but people broken, coming to realize that somehow or another, we've missed the road along this way. We don't know the Christ of this Bible like we ought to know. In the study up there in the book of Hebrews, I've come to know you have both Christ as, as, as Aaron being a type of him as a priesthood up to a certain point. Then you have Melchizedek, whom you said Christ was a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. I said to the folks last night, you know, you have a mention of that Melchizedek. In the book of Genesis, a thousand years later, he shows up in the book of Psalms. Then two thousand years more, you find him here in the book of Hebrews. But there in the book of Hebrews, he's showing us the two stages of Christianity. Most people, when they come into the church, they know Christ as a priest of Aaron. That is forgiveness and acceptance. But they never move beyond that to that Melchizedek priest. He said he spoke to us in these last days in Christ. That just simply means that Christ is within us, speaking within us. They never move beyond that to know Christ, to really talk to that heart. But God has invited us to be a part of the first fruit. Now, first fruits in anything that you get, if you let it ripen on the vine, the first fruits gets more of the nourishment than anything else that comes on that vine. It's the sweetest and most tender fruit. Jesus, Paul said, was the first fruit of those that are going to come from the dead. 
Now the giving of the first fruit in the Old Testament, you know the priests would wave that. They'd, they cut that first fruit, they waved it to, as, as a sign of, of a harvest that's a coming. Now the Old Testament that really talked about a harvest, but that type was that Christ was the first fruit that was waved and given testimony that there's more coming. Hallelujah to God. There's a resurrection coming. There's a harvest coming. Paul wrote that Christ was the first fruits of those who were raised from the dead and was a type of those that are to come. That old Methodist song says, If I'm not caught up alive, I will be there anyway. There will be those that come forth from the grave. Now the priest of the Old Testament, you know, had the privilege of eating that first fruit. Now those of us that take up this privilege, and it's a choice you have to make. Everybody's not going to do that, and I'll tell you why in this message. But those of us that have that privilege, make that choice, are partaking and being a part of that first fruit, amen, uh, will we'll surely eat of the best fruit there is. I said, we'll eat the sweetest and tenderest fruit of it all. Those of us who take it. But this is an invitation that God extends to you and I as we come to this final hour. And I, I felt in, in Israel that morning, I was broke with them. And I felt that God said, you'll keynote that convention with this. And you'll say, especially to that preacher, I'm inviting you to be a part of this final harvest. But you've got to know it's going to cost something. You can drift along if you like. You can play church if you want to. Or you can come to the place and be this that God intends. You know, I've found people, people today, when you, when you begin to talk about what I'm going to talk about, a death to self, and whatever we are, people would rather sacrifice their own health than to obey God. Amen. You know all, all of the death to self isn't some kind of a pain. It's a doing it without some things that we don't need. It is giving ourselves over to God where He totally, absolutely possesses our lives. That's an invitation God gives to you and I as we come to this final hour. But what we must understand is that first wave has to die. There's no other way. God's inviting you to come in here and be a part of something. And His appeal to you is, Give me your body as that living sacrifice. You have no will but my will. You have no hope. Jesus came over and over. He said, I come to do the will of God. The whole salvation of Christ was to deliver me from my will to the will of God. That is redemption, folks. I said, that is redemption. Where there's no part of me has anything to do with me. This is the invitation of God. He invites us to die. That's to be that. All that we are must go to the cross if Christ is going to be resurrected in our lives. Make no mistake about it, preacher. If he's not resurrected in your life, he will not be resurrected in that church's life. That church is a product of ministry. God never pointed a finger at a sheep. If the thing is dead, if it's caught up in the silliness of our time, it's because a preacher led them into that prairie of darkness and death. My God, he's talking to us tonight. It's going to cost something to turn this church around. He's inviting us to be a part of that first fruit. All of us are in this building. But I, I'm, I'm saying to the pastor tonight that that sheep will never go there. He's colorblind. He don't know what's green or what's brown. He's got to be led into the green pastures. All that Christ wants out of me is obedience. I, I, I won't have to say anything else tonight. 
That's all he wants. He wants me to draw no blueprint for him. He simply wants obedience. As part of the first root, we taste will be what we taste will be sweeter than anybody else tastes. But it costs something to be. The choice has to be ours. God forces that on no man. But he holds out the possibility of this to us. What we must know is this. And if you don't hear anything else, hear this. There can be no fruit in our life until we understand the death of Christ and the death of our own life. There cannot, except a corn of wheat, fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. A farmer don't plant seed for purification. No, sir, he plants it for production. We are seeds in his hands, what he's telling us. And if you're willing to die, if you choose like Christ to die, leave the resurrection with God, there'll be a fruit come out of our lives that'll last. It'll be something, not the foolishness of our time, but the fruit of eternal life. If we will, the death of Jesus has its value only. And its value and efficacy in obedience, ours as well. The whole value of the death of Christ was in his obedience. With Christ, obedience was God's great object in his suffering and the root and power of his perfection in glory. His obedience to God. So it is with us. The necessity of obedience is no less with me than it was with Christ. We made light of it. We, we treated people that treated this book lightly as if God would. But you know God taught some lessons through the greatest man in this Bible outside of God, Moses. One act of disobedience and he wasn't allowed to cross that river, folks. I can tell you he registers a message in time. There's no less expected out of me than it was of Christ. You know, when you have in the seventh chapter of the Gospel of John, the Bible said, Jesus, John quoting Jesus, he said, Out of your belly, he that believeth on me, as the scripture said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. And John, with his long, long experience as an apostle, said, This spake he of the Spirit, because Jesus wasn't yet glorified. The Holy Ghost was not yet given, uh, because Jesus was not yet glorified. He spoke of a Holy Ghost, and it said it wasn't given. Well, theologians have wrestled with that down through the ages. We've, we've made it, and I know this is true in a degree, that it wasn't given like it's given to us to come live within it, but it's more to it than that. I said, it's more to it. When he got up there, when he was glorified, sat down at the right hand of the Father, he sent that Holy Ghost back to his church. But he never sent it back till he walked this pathway by the Holy Spirit. He overcome everything I'll ever face. And when he sat down, he said, Duke Downs, you're without an excuse. I've given you the Holy Ghost. I walked this path with the Holy Ghost. I was tempted in every point you are. But I overcame in the power of the Holy Spirit. We're without excuse tonight. Totally without excuse. Amen. The necessity with us, with God in Christ, our restoration to obedience was a great aim of, of, of redemption. The great aim, listen, obedience is the only way to that union with God in which our happiness uh, consists. Through obedience alone, God can reveal His power in and through our lives. And if that doesn't happen, it's a farce. It's all an illusion if it isn't Christ. If Christ isn't all, then all is absolutely nothing, folks. You can't learn how to prophesy. You can't learn how to work miracles. It's only God Almighty that works miracles. And only through obedience. Only through obedience do I come to the place that God Almighty can reveal that Son in and through my life. The Bible said he learned obedience. How about the things that he suffered? You know, I, I, I said, how can this be? 
How can he, the Lord from heaven, have to learn obedience? And God showed me. Amen. He said he becomes so much. He's so actually, in reality, took my nature that he had to learn obedience like me. There was nothing left out. He was ever been a man. I said he took this nature on himself and walked it out. Totally, absolutely, and he learned obedience with the things that he suffered. Amen. Now listen, he learned obedience, and being perfected, became to all them that obey him the cause, the apostle said, of eternal salvation. Because he learned obedience, he became that. Oh, that God will help us to hear. Our obedience is as indispensable as His. Just as He could not work out our salvation without obedience, obedience, you cannot enjoy it or have it without that same obedience. It's not going to happen. He don't save rebels. He delivers rebels. Amen. He don't have rebels in His kingdom. We make them that. They're not tares in here. There has to be that obedience if I'm going to have Christ to live in through this life. So the invitation to the first fruits is an invitation to live this cross. You hear me. That's a strange phrase. First time I ever heard it come out of my mouth, I said to my wife, we're driving down freeway going somewhere. And I, I said to her, that, that thought, I said, you know, we're really called to live this cross. What do you mean live the cross? I mean live that cross with a constant death going on in me and a resurrection. All the while, that cross works death to what can die and a resurrection to that which can live. There can really be no resurrection of Christ unless you're willing to die. That's the reason you can't be first fruits unless you allow that cross to work death to what you are. Something in you has to become that burnt offering if there's going to be an increase of God in that life. This is what he's saying. First fruits is produced through the cross of Christ and the wonder of that resurrection. It's not possible for this flesh to please or obey God Almighty. It's a rebel from the start. Absolutely impossible no matter how you dress it up. We don't believe in Darwinian evolution. But I can tell you the Pentecostal church that I belong to and been a preacher in in the last 50 years has produced a spiritual evolution. They're teaching men that you can grow into this life. We run them through a Sunday school. We educate them, dress them up, and then tell them that Christ lives in them. I can tell you if Christ lives in you, they won't nobody have to tell anybody that because he that made it all things. If Christ really lives in this life, men are going to know that he lives there. He that created all things by whom all things consist, if he takes up that abode in a human heart, that human heart will be full of him. First fruits is produced through the cross. Amen. God must be allowed through death and resurrection to make us the message that we preach. You see, all the while as you live this cross, amen, there's a death taking place to what you are and a resurrection into what he is. That's where the miracles of the gospel come from. They don't come out of men learning how to prophesy or learning how to work miracles. Christ is a miracle worker. All things were by him, for him. He's not only the beginning, he's the end and the middle. He's all of it. Only as Christ lives in that life can, can we see what God wants. But he's not going to live in this flesh pot we call the church. You know, it's a strange thing. This, this soft, underbellied thing that we call a church today. If you deal with it, it'll fall apart like a house of cards. My, my, my pastor's been preaching the gospel. I'm telling you that this world needs to hear. I, I, I've, I've listened. I don't get to be home much. But I saw a message coming in that church, electrifying the cross there. But it deal with some things. You just see some of them fall apart out there. Amen. You see that soft, underbellied thing that calls itself a church. It can't stand to be dealt with. But deal with it we most. I said deal with it. We must. Folks. There has to 
overcome that dealing with that heart. If Christ is going to live, you're going to have to die. Understand? If I'm a temple of God, there can't be a temple of both of us. David and David and Saul both couldn't be on the throne at the same time. One of them's got to get off. Abraham had no trouble in his tent. I, I, until Isaac was born. No problems, none. Everything. They said Ishmael was 13 years old. Everything's wonderful. But the day that spiritual child come in that tent, all hell broke loose in that tent, and there's no need in trying to divide the tent. Don't try to appease Hagar. Tell her she's got to get out. That's all. I don't, that sounds unkind, but it isn't, because that's the only way Christ can live. I said, that's the only way that Christ can live. Living this cross produces that only. Our message is Christ. They went everywhere preaching Christ. And the whole message God's trying to make me is it's not I, but Christ lives within me. In the morning at 8 o'clock, I'm going to show you something about that. I believe that God put in my spirit. Amen. I'd lay awake and weep as I thought about what he showed me about the citizen of this kingdom. What it really is. Listen to it again. Amen. Our message, God working death in us, a resurrection to Christ, to make us what we preach. Our message is Christ. They went everywhere preaching Christ. To preach Christ, Christ must be revealed. And Paul said in Galatians 1, 15 and 16, But when it pleased God to reveal His Son in Him, in me, that I might preach Him among the heathen. Amen. You know the apostle in one verse, in, in one of his epistles, I believe the fourth chapter of, of the book of 1 Corinthians, maybe second, but he says two times, the life also of Jesus. He said, the life also of Jesus. He talked about being in death often. Amen. That wasn't somebody trying to kill him. That's pneumonia. That's malaria. Everything in the world come against him. A night and a day in the deep. Amen. But he said, the life also of Jesus. You see, if I'm really born, if I'm really filled with the Holy Ghost, I have two lives. I got a frail life that's 83 years old, but I got a life of Jesus. They left him stoned for death. I said, they left him stoned dead. But the life also of Jesus got up. Up and he beat them back to town. Hallelujah to God. But that life also of Jesus cannot be produced, ladies and gentlemen, without the cross of Christ. All your learning, memorizing the Bible, all, all of this strange stuff that we've got coming in church isn't going to produce that. It's through your death and His resurrection that Christ lives. If you're a temple, then you've got to, if you're the temple of Christ, some got to be dealt with you. For Christ to be revealed in you, then the cross of Christ must be allowed to work death in you. To share Christ's glory is to share His suffering. According to 1 Corinthians 1, 23 through 25, in the cross of Christ, we have everything. Oh, so glad, Pastor, chose that old rugged cross tonight. One of the main evangelists, call him evangelist, and nothing even resembles evangelists about what I was hearing. But he said, you don't have to cling to the old rugged cross. No, you don't have to. Man said to me, he said, you don't have to talk in tongues. I said, I know that. You don't have to. But if you feel with the Holy Ghost, you will. Amen. <laughs> Don't, don't come here what you have to. I, I, you know, I, I tell all the time, I, that poster in that dentist's office said, you don't have to floss all your teeth, just the ones you want to keep. You know, <laughs> you don't have to die. You can live if you want to, but if you want Christ to live, you're going to die. We're going to get rid of you. Christ is going to live. You'll look like the same on the outside, but your actions won't be the same. I said your actions won't be the same. When Christ lives and in and through that believer, amen, in the cross we have everything. That which produces fruit, the Bible says, life comes out of death. As you die, then life comes, Christ's life. But if you save that life, I read it to you, you're going to lose this other life. You can't have both 
of them, folks. You understand that? It won't work in the church. It won't work in you. It won't work anyway, anywhere. If you have my life, he said, then you're going to have to lose your life. You're going to have to be willing to go to Calvary, to die, to what you are, your own ambition. You don't have no ideas that he needs. He's got everything he needs. He just wants your obedience. We don't have nothing to offer him but an empty possibility. That's all. That the cross is everything. That which produces life out of death. That which is wisdom. The Bible said Christ has made unto us wisdom. Amen. There is no wisdom outside of Christ. But that wisdom of Christ will never function in your life as long as you maintain number one. As long as you're suggesting to him how this thing is supposed to work, then the wisdom of God will never work. But the cross must effectively deal with all that is not of him and then the wisdom of God. The cross is that which produces power because the Bible said all power has been given to Christ. If Christ lives, there'll be power. If you live, there'll be religion. But if Christ can live in and through, Paul said, for me to live is Christ. Two years in November, Brother White and I were in Albania. That's Illyricum. That's where Paul was. We were looking how to cross that land. You know, as I stood there thinking, this man has come 1,800 miles from, from, from Jerusalem. He's come halfway across earth almost. Amen. Here he is in a strange land, a people, listen, a people that never heard of Jesus, and yet here's one man got to convince them that there's a man died in Jerusalem as a criminal was a son of God. Now try that with an argument, sir. I can tell you Christ must live if that happens. I said Christ must live. He, I, I stood there that day looking across. 2,000 years ago, that man walked here. They never heard of this Christ. He's come to tell them about one that died as a criminal, but is a son of God. That Christ must live in him. If they're going to know and believe, then Christ has to live in the Apostle Paul in Illyricum 2,000 years ago. He was as much alive in Albania 2,000 years ago as he ever was when he walked this earth. That's the gospel. See, Paul was a dead man on a furlough. He had no, no nothing. He was a true believer. He, 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 he never, he, he, he was willing to sacrifice the present for any kind of a, a future, for the future that was ahead of him. Amen. In the cross, listen, and, and we have that which overcome the world. Revival only comes through people that understand suffering. It don't come through the people like you and I that everything got to be just right. You know, I used to get letters, evangelists want to come, said, I always have to have a first-class ticket. I stay in a five-star hotel. Well, we didn't have five-star here then. Amen. <laughs> what we had flooded out every now and then. That's four many of them got here. But I knew he wasn't no good to me. I didn't care if he rode first class on the tail of the airplane. The thing is, I wanted a revival. Uh, all he is wanting is some plush space to lay down. Revival don't come through that, folks. No, no. I said it don't come through that. It comes through dead men that are willing to be anywhere, anytime, any place for God, whatever he wants out of our life. He's talking to us, preachers. I'm telling you tonight, God, God is asking for your life tonight. I said he's asking for that life tonight. Amen. If you're praying for a revival, you must understand. You've got to understand suffering and willing to take up a cross. In Luke 22 and 42, Jesus is in Gethsemane. He's there just before. This is the final test, folks. Uh, this, is, this is the final test of his obedience to God. And the whole test of it, am I willing to go through with this? Now, make no mistake about it, he could have backed out. Amen. He could have. He wouldn't have prayed that prayer if it wasn't possible for him to back away from that. 
But in that garden he prayed, not my will but thine. If it be possible, he said, let this cup pass from me. I don't want to drink this. And the thing he didn't want was that moment when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? When he had to lose the face in the presence of God. But he said, not my will but thine. Nevertheless, he submitted, listen, if Christ be not risen, Paul said, your faith is vain, but without death there can be no resurrection. He had to die to be raised. There is no resurrection apart from this death. In Gethsemane, in Gethsemane Jesus was overwhelmed with sorrow. We don't know how long he was in such a state, perhaps a long time. We were Pastor Downs and I, we were preaching in Ireland this last May. We were there in a kind of a camp meeting there, wonderful time together preaching the gospel. And one morning I got in behind the drums over in that corner and I, I hooked up. I mean, you know, got hooked up, not, not 110, but 240 over in that corner. And an old song I hadn't heard four times in my life began to roll through my spirit, lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget your agony, lest I forget your love for me, lead me to Calvary. Oh, my God. God, what a song. You don't have much that kind of songs anymore, folks. But I can tell you one thing. If you know him, you're going to come to that place. Without death, it can't. He was overwhelmed. Don't know how long, perhaps a long time. The disciples fell asleep, and he went through that agony three times. And the agony was simply this. Am I really going to do what my Father wants me to do? Am I going to really go through this? That was the agony of that moment. Let me tell you something, preacher, and, 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 and member, whoever, if you're a child of God, you too will pass through your Gethsemane. Make no mistake about it. If you walk with God, you can back away, you can play games, you can be lost or maybe saved as before. I don't know about that. But I'm going to tell you, if you walk with God, you're going to face that. If you allow the cross of Christ to work in you, your soul will come to a place where it is overwhelmed with sorrow. Make no mistake about it. You are going to be brought there to where it's overwhelmed. You're going to pass through what you're going to say, why does any human ever have to face what I face? That's, that's how death is affected. You'll face a decision that will cost you everything to obey. Mark it down. If you walk with God, there's a corner somewhere you're going to come to, and you're going to face that Gethsemane. You're going to face it. It's going to cost you everything. This is how God invites us, amen, to make him known to a world. To live the cross is to press on in death until Christ lives through your life. There is no other. There is no other folks. There's no inventions. Don't, don't go trying to invent some kind of a program. All you're going to do is produce a bunch of tares that are going to kill you before it's over with. But if you press on till Christ is alive, they're always attracted to Christ. Amen. They was never had enough room wherever he was. Amen. Life comes out of death. If Christ is to become our life, then the cross must be allowed to work death to what you are. And God knows how to do that. If I follow him, I'll be led to that place. God will bring me to that place. Amen. Jesus' goal was to die. For this he came. For 30 years he walked toward Calvary. Those, those whole years of his life. Amen. He walked toward Calvary. He came to die, folks. He was a dead man when he got here. Said he was slain before the foundation of the world. He came to die. Friends begged him not to go to Jerusalem. They knew Herod wanted to kill him. Amen. His answer was, go you tell that fox. Behold, I cast out devils, and the third day I will be perfected. Luke 13, 32. All the way through his life, he was heading for death. He was living the 
cross every minute, rejected by friends, by brothers, by families, hated by the people that he come to save. There's a cross at work in that life. I said, there's a cross all the way along. He's a living that cross because his ultimate objective was to die. The resurrection was the Father's responsibility. And God's saying to you and I, if you choose the dying, leave the resurrection to me. That's all. He, it took absolute faith for him to pass where no man ever came back from. He went all the way to hell and opened them prison doors. He didn't go down to submit to hell. But I can tell you, he passed into a world that nobody ever come back from. Amen. But he, his objective was to die, but the responsibility was the Father's, but the dying was his own. You have to choose if you're going to be this. You can spend your life playing the games of religion, or you can throw yourself and be effective. Amen. The ultimate thing, this is the only pathway to the signs, the wonders, the power of gospel that brings the nations to God is that pathway to death what we are. The Father will do that if we will choose the dying. This is our part. So the appeal of God to that human heart. Let me read you. I told you to stay in Matthew. That's chapter 10. We're going to read seven verses here, 32 through 39. The appeal of God. You see, uh, this, this living, this cross, walking with God. Here he says, Whosoever shall confess me before men, him will I confess. That's verse 32 now through 39. Verse 32, Whoever will con therefore will confess me before men, him also will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I'm come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace but a sword. For I'm come to set a man at bearance against his father, daughter against her mother, daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law, and a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. He loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. He that taketh not up his cross and follows after me is not worthy of me. And he that finds his life shall lose it. But he that loveth his life for my sake, uh, he that, he that lo loveth his life, uh, uh, loses his life for my sake shall find it. Amen. The typewriter didn't work good here. There's a fundamental difference. Listen. There's a fundamental difference between the appeal of a corporation and the appeal of God. There's a fundamental difference between the appeal of a mass movement of any kind than there is of appeal of a practical organization. You know and I know that practical organization, when he's out looking, wanting, trying to get somebody, he offers an opportunity for self-advancement. It appeals mainly to self-interest. We There's a great possibility if you come, you can climb this ladder, you can wind up with a good salary, you can do good. That's the appeal of AT&T, Bell Telephone, whoever else. That is the appeal. Amen. But the, the practical organization, the Christianity, has reduced itself to this. Most of the appeals you hear in the church is to come get rich, be happy, amen, have a good time. I was, I was riding through Beaumont and a sign in front of a fairly large church said, come and have fun with us Sunday. That was the whole thing. 2,000 million people never heard the name of Jesus. Now we're going to come have fun together. Amen. I can tell you there's joy, but not fun. There's joy, I said, but they're not the foolishness that men call joy. This whole thing, listen, Christianity has reduced itself. But the appeal of true Christianity, particularly in its revival phase, is to those who crave to get rid of that unwanted self. It's, it is an appeal to those that want to get rid. They don't find life worth living for, except they're united with something worthwhile. Amen. That's the reason our kids are committing suicide. That's the reason kids go in high school and shoot others. Life don't mean anything. They can't see a hundred yards down the road. But if the church will be the church, my God, we can give them something to die for. 
greatest cause of death around the world among young people is suicide. They don't have anything to live for. Amen. This, this whole thing, people who see their lives. The Bible said all mass movements don't want to attract and hold a following, not because they can satisfy the desire for self-advancement, but because it can satisfy the passion for self-renunciation. That's how, that's the attraction of that church. Give a man something to live for, to challenge his life. Amen. He'll rise up to the occasion. It's not a matter we expect too much out of the people. We don't expect enough out of them, for heaven's sake. Just come sit down, listen to a sermon on a Sunday morning, not challenge. Give that life. Give what you are. Give it all. Die to what you are. There'll be something come out of this. The gospel is so structured. When it's faithfully proclaimed, it'll bring men to see self as it is. You'll see this is what I want to be. If this gospel is to such people, the prospect of an individual career cannot stir them to a mighty effort nor evoke in them a faith of single-minded dedication. Amen. The church we, we were in, in Jordan with this school. We got through with it the last night. Brother White and I, we went with a great friend having dinner and visiting with him. And a, a pastor there, one of the main pastors of the Jordan, he never came to the school but the last night. And he was there talking, and he was talking about building a $3 million training center. Well, I don't have anything to lose. I said to him, why do you want to build a training center? You're not training nobody. You know, there ain't a soul out here you're training. Well, we were talking, he turned to us, and he almost wept. He said, I can tell you, uh, this, this is the thing, that's whether I'm even called or not. He said, ain't nobody in here won't be called to preach. I said, ain't nobody in that atmosphere going to be called to preach. Ain't nothing to give yourself for. They maybe want to be like you on two Mercedes and have a million dollars in the bank. Now they maybe want to call for that. But there's nothing in this place to call a young man to leave what you have and go to Africa and proclaim to other people. There's nothing that says that young person, it's worthwhile to go to India. I said, there's nothing. He said to me, he said to me, what I got to do? I said, you got to get somebody to preach these people, get them stirred up, make them realize that Christianity is not an hour and a half Sunday morning, got a little social event. It's a place where I come to rededicate, renew, lay on that altar and die. Place where everything. Well, he called us back. We went back a week. Went back a week and preached right in the middle of the sermon. I'm dealing with it. And I said, you know, it's awful easy for a preacher to get up here and get a tear coming down his cheek. A little infraction in his voice make you think he's holy. Amen. But his wife think he's holy. He just stopped preaching. He said, I've been that man. That's what he said. I've been that man. I've been that man. Let me tell you something, folks. They're, they're the, who, who wants to die for a welfare state? Amen. You, you understand what I'm saying? Who wants to die for a church that isn't going anywhere? All it's got is a lot of lemonade parties and a gymnasium to play in. Don't believe nothing. The dress codes of the world got more morals than some communities didn't have in it. Who wants to give his life to take that anywhere? Now I can tell you if you die, Christ lives, and you can see him, you go anywhere, anytime, any place because you're a dead man. That's the call of God, and that's the appeal of God in this convention. That's the appeal of God in this convention. Amen. Amen. The innermost craving in, in most people is for a new life, a rebirth, a sense of worth, a purpose by identification with a holy cause. That, that, that people want to connect with something that makes my life worthwhile. I'm with something. Man worth a billion dollars, he dies. Sam Walton died. Amen. They just scared it among seven other. They won a quarter. I don't care if it's been a hundred thousand dollars for the casket. And nothing, nothing got him across the river if he wasn't right. And nothing in that. It was a wasted life. If you got four hundred billion, it's a wasted life, folks. It's when I'm a part of something that endures forever. Thank God. 
This is the appeal of God. If you lose your life, I'll give you a life. But if you want to save that miserable life, you can have it. That's all. It may last 40 or 80 years, but when it's over, it's over. And I don't care how much money you got in that bank. I can tell you the only reason God ever let a Christian man get rich is that he could trust him. That's all. No other reason whatsoever. That's the only reason that ever happened. Let me tell you. Amen. Garibaldi, he passed through Italy during that time way back. And he passed through, come through Florence, 2 o'clock in the morning. Young people like today, leisure, nothing to do. No, no hope, no, you know, just more money than knew what to do with. Amen. Effeminacy everywhere. Boys with earrings and women, women wearing men's clothes and, you know, women trying to be men, men trying to be women. The whole thing a mess along the line. And he comes along at two o'clock in the morning and he says, boys, come here. And they come and say, don't you to follow me. What's in it for us, man? Said, bleeding feet, hungry stomachs, and a part of Italy's greatest victory. And they followed him to the man. I can tell you this, young people in this nation, if challenged with this gospel, give yourself, amen, give yourself to something bigger than you. That... 10 billion years from now, it'll still be a moving on. That challenge him with the opportunity to rise up and be what God wants. Hallelujah. It's true. Listen, in an active Bible-centered, spirit-filled church offers the opportunity to men for both of these. It's true that any, that among the early adherents, of any mass movement, there's adventurers who join for their own selfish interests. We have an Ananias and Sapphira right in the door of the Bible. They said, this thing looks good. We'll see how it works. We, we will sell it for them, give them half of it. If it don't work out, we'll have something to lay back on. Well, I can tell you, till you give it all, folks, you've given nothing. I said, till you give it all, till the young boy had only given one fish and one loaf of bread, they wouldn't have been fed. No, no, nobody, they'd, been, they'd went nowhere. But when he gave everything he had, I can tell you poverty's great riches in his hands. Amen. And you are a person with God. And if you're willing to give yourself in that manner, this is the call of God. They're always them kind of people. They'll always be. But when a revival movement and I've watched it in the 50 years of preacher when that revival movement begins to attract people who are interested in their own career, it's a sign that it's over with. When I see a man wanting to be the superintendent, I said it's over with with the movement because they tolerate such a thing. And it's over with with him because he's lost sight. I said he's lost sight of what he's born for. When a man's campaigning for something in the church, then you know, I said you know, that it's time. It's over with with that movement movement. It's no longer engaged in molding a new world, but it's possessing and preserving the present. Everything's trying to hold on to what we got. It ceases to be a movement, becomes an enterprise, and the more posts and offices that a movement has to offer, the less worth it is to God. Hitler may be the most wicked man ever lived, one of the most for sure, but he did know some things. One thing he made a statement in Mein Kampf was, he said, the only thing worse than not having enough help is to have too much. When you go to attract in the wrong people, when you go to attract them, amen. When this happens, the mission of such a movement is done for. Faith in his kingdom, faith in the kingdom of God, I'm going to talk about this, must fill the vacuum created by lost faith in ourselves. A faith in that kingdom. When my faith, not in me, not in not any hope here, but in him, the less justified a man has in claiming excellence for himself, the more ready to claim excellence for his God and the cause. The burning conviction that we have a holy duty toward others is a driving force of a revival church. Take away that conviction and the church begins to dig trenches. Amen. When David went to that field, Israel is dug in. There's a man out there ten foot tall, and his voice echoes up and down, challenging Israel, and all of them hid down the ditch. And the young, young, young pastor got 30 little sheep, maybe got a little church over, 30 in Sunday school. Amen. He comes down, bring a little bread to his brothers. 
hears that roar across the river and says, why, why are you in this hole? Is there not a cause? Oh my God, is there not a cause? Why are you tucked down in here? Why are you letting the God of heaven be insulted by such as this? Don't you know there's a cause out here? Why are you? Oh, shut up, boy. You don't know what you're talking about. There's trouble out there. That man 10 foot tall said, so he's got a sword taller than you are. Amen. Well, Saul heard about him, you know. Saul heard about him. They come up, what's your qualification? Well, not much. I don't have no mega church. I'm telling you, about 30 folks in the Sunday school. But I'm telling you, a bear come down against so much. I killed that bear with my hands. Yes, sir. I, I took him apart. Oh, listen, I, I took a oh, hole. I killed him. Said another time a lion come, I killed him. That's pretty good credentials. I said, that's pretty good credential. But you know, they hated him. Those brothers hated him. Oh, listen, is there not a cause? I angered them. Those brothers were zest with an evil heart of unbelief. That, that's what it says in the book of, Galatia, uh, book of Hebrews. Evil heart of unbelief. Sin had turned their heart from the seen unseen to the seen. You listen to me. See, it turned. That's where most preachers are today. They get up 60 years old and worry about retirement. I don't know what I'm going to do. I need some kind of business to bolster this up after a while. Well, you over with with you if you don't pray through. I said, I said, it's over with. It ain't retirement, mister. It's oppressing the balls to this kingdom. It's it's pushing this thing to the hill. Amen. I said moving on with God. It didn't matter. It didn't matter of this sin had turned those older brothers heart from the unseen to the seen, from God to self. Faith in God lost its proper place and become faith in the visible world. All I could see is that giant. God's gone now. Pentecost is there. I remember a time when a person come in that church sick. We never advised them where to find a good doctor, something to help them. Amen. We prayed them through. We had to go home with them. We encouraged them. We told them God, God was a healer. Amen. We, had, we didn't know the best doctor in town. We didn't know any remedies. We just knew God Almighty. Amen. We had a an answer to the situation but today we've got everything in the world to offer but God everything everything to offer amen faith faith amen listen though you say elder brothers listen now an unbelief that's a great mark of evil heart the great proof of sin the great cause of darkness and damnation unbelief that's all that is that no matter how you how you name it Israel never possessed that land the Bible said because of unbelief they wouldn't cross that river they're afraid of them giants they saw something out there they lost sight of the unseen looking to seen all they could see is the walls amen those older brothers were not interested in any gospel message that threatened their miserable selfish lives I'm telling most of the church isn't either. You you bring her down the line's gonna cost you everything. Well, I can I can find a man with a better message than that. Yeah, I can find somebody got a got a different message than that. Take heed, brethren, lest there be in you an evil heart of unbelief departing from the living God. Remove the cross from your message. I said this a lot of years ago. I said, remove the cross from your message, and you'll have ten professors to everyone you got now. I can tell you the user friendly proved me to be a prophet, brother. I must have said that 25 years ago. I said, remove the cross. You'll have 10 more people for every one you got now, Pastor. Don't ever. And the user friendly, secret sensitive, I proved me a prophet. Yes, sir. Just remove that which costs man. You can go to heaven, you can mix it all up. You don't, it ain't going to cost you anything. Just come in here, add Jesus to whatever you are. Everything's going to be all right. Yeah, you'll see how that is. Remove the cross from your message. One of the most potent attraction appeals of the gospel is the offering of a substitute for individual hope. Oh, hallelujah. When our individual interests and prospects do not seem worth living for, we're in desperate need of something apart from ourselves to live for. I come to a place in my life, I didn't know nothing about God. I was on an island, a Peleliu. I never had a flashback in all those years. I got out of the war, I forgot that. I just lived my life. I refused uh, to live that. I got it behind me. But two years ago, Pastor and I were preaching together in, in, in Panama City, and a man gave me a book, Peleliu, The Forgotten Corner of Hell. I put it in my briefcase, brought it home, and I got, got 
forgot I had it. One night I was going to bed, I got, began to read it. I read just a few lines. I could smell the blood, so I'm telling you. It all come back as much a reality as anything ever was. No different by Zach. I could hear the screams. I, I could hear I'd put it away. Never no more of that. But you know, on that island, we'd come back. We'd march back. There's just a handful of us left in the company, in the battalion. And the captain said to us, there's not enough of us. We've got to join another company. I've been out there now 30-something months. I've been shot once. I've lived in them holes. I've eaten the slop we had to take off them sometime. I've lived with malaria. Uh, you know, and I, I, in, I never said a word. But I said, I, I just somehow or another, how far can you push a man? You know, uh, how, how much can a man take? You know, I'm all of 22 years old at that time. How, how, how much of this can you take? I, I, I don't see how I can go any further. Nothing come out of my mouth. But while I was there, somebody along the line had left an old Japanese flag hanging on a bush. And I saw that thing. I'm saying, there's got to be something worth living for, mister. I saw that flag. I said, Clinton, you'll either fight or that'll hang over your village. My great-granddaughter, a little hope here tonight, be living under that thing if you don't get up. Do you see, when there's something bigger than you, you can go where you couldn't go. And you can do what you couldn't do. You understand what I'm talking about. When there's something, something, some cause, amen, some cause that's bigger than you are, Hallelujah. The gospel in its truest sense gives men that hope. When an individual or a society is ripe for the appeal of God, you must know they're ripe for any mass movement comes down the road. I said they're ripe for anything. So all forms you have today, self-dedicate. You see these kids, that boy that just shot those wherever he was. He belonged to that neo-Nazi thing, see? Amen. You, you sign everywhere. See these kids all in that devil fingernails painted black and uh, you know black just all kinds of, it's, it is all kinds of things listen all I'm telling you is amen and in, when they're ripe all forms of self dedicated devotion, loyalty, self surrender are in essence a desperate clinging to something that will give meaning to a small life you understand that's out there don't matter where are we going going to blow the thing up anyway what's the hope of it all Hence, the embracing of a substitute is going to be passionate and extreme. That's the reason that drug world, those devil-possessed rockers out there, they got your kids committing suicide. They put their theology to song. They put it to music. We sing about ourselves now, but they sing about what they want you to do. You understand what I'm telling you? They're, they're throwing something at them. Amen. A substitute. Amen. Embraced in moderation cannot supplant uh, the self that we want to crucify. So they will. That drug culture. That's the reason it's so passionate. We can have qualified faith in ourselves. But the faith we have in God has to be extravagant and uncompromising. We cannot be sure we have something worth living for until we're ready to die for it. You never, you never, never, amen. We cannot be sure until we're ready. The readiness to die is evident to me and to others that indeed this is the way. It said they love not their lives unto death. Who are the most likely converts to a move of God of our time? Who are they? Or to an, to an appeal of any mass movement? I'll tell you there's a tendency to judge a race, a nation, or a church by its least unworthy members. That it's always that tendency. But though manifestly unfair, this has some justification. I, I'm going to close here if you just stay awake a little bit longer. Nudge you there a little. Just listen. Though manifestly unfair, the tendency has some justification. For the character and destiny of a group are often determined by its inferior elements. You listen to me. It's often determined the inner mass of the nation, for instance, us in the middle. That's most of us here tonight. We're that middle class, the decent average people who pay the taxes, 
do the work are shaped by the mignonettes of both ends, the top and the bottom. That, the, the, the most of us, you listen to me, the superior individual pays a large role in shaping a nation. But so do the individuals to the other extreme. The failures, misfits, homosexuals get more attention than you do. Amen. You listen. Those on both ends. It's the misfits, outcasts, criminals, all those who lost their footing and never had any in the respectable ranks of humanity. Humanity. Let me tell you, the game of history usually played by the best and the worst over the heads of the majority of us in the middle. That's how it's played. The reason the inferior elements of a nation can exert an influence on its cause is because they're without reverence for the present. Have no reverence for the present. They never had nothing. They have no reverence for it. And the mark of a true believer is a man that's willing to sacrifice the present for the future. You never come to be a believer till that happens. Till you come to that point that you're willing to sacrifice the present for the future. I had a young man with me work in Russia, one of the finest young men. He come to the place, got to talking to Brother White. He said, you know, I don't have a house. I don't have anything. I don't have this. And once it got into him, Brother White talked to him, son, you, you have everything. He was such a, such a blessing to us. He had learned that language. Wasn't afraid of the devil himself. I mean, he was a man for us. Brother White talked to him. He told me, he said, he, he, he's, he's got ideas on things. Today is out. Today is out. That, that isn't what you need. Oh, no, folks. That isn't what you need at all. we got to come. Now, <clears throat> they crave these people to lose their small lives in some spectacular communal action. They're all potential converts to any movement that offers them hope. If we'll stand up, folks, I'm telling you, they're out there. I said they're out there ready to hear us. The discarded, the rejected are often the raw material for a sweeping move of God. The stone that the builders rejected have come the main place. It's become a cornerstone of a new move. We, want, we, want, we were always looking uh, for the upper class, for the wealthy, for the this, for that. They're usually not interested in anything you have to say. Those who have lost any reverence for the future, if you can put a hope in them, they'll rise up and stand. You know, it was not the irony of history that the undesired in the countries of Europe crossed an ocean and built a new world on this continent. Only they could do that because they had no reverence for the present. There's nothing for me in this country. I don't know whether this earth is flat or round. I don't know whether that ship will sail off of somewhere out there, but I'm willing to ride it. If it'll take me to some place where there's some kind of a hope. God's challenging us tonight. The appeal of God. Come and die. Die to everything you are. Let me have you totally, absolutely. And through you, I will affect this world. Let us stand. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lift your hands. Here before God. I said here before God tonight. Just standing here in this altar tonight. Amen. Just standing here before the living God. Lift those hands. God. I said, God is speaking to us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God's, God's appeal to you tonight. Give me your life. No reservations. If you've got reservations, stay where you are. But give me your life. I want you dead to everything you ever dreamed and become what I dream. That's a call. That's the appeal of God. Hallelujah. 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 Hallelujah, hallelujah.